Dear viewer, good evening and welcome to Spotlight. With me tonight, the special agent in charge of the FBI, uh, the Mr. David Chelios. I'm going to pronounce it right, Mr. David? Chelios. 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 Yes. Uh, welcome to, to MEA. This is your first time coming here. And uh, we would like to introduce you to the community. So if you could tell us for like two to three minutes, who is David Julius? Julius, and, uh, and uh, what do you work before, and how long you've been in Michigan? All right, well first, thank you for having me this evening. Pleasure. And uh, a little bit about myself. So I'm, a, I'm actually a Northwest Ohio native, uh, mm -hmm. but my family roots on my father's side are in the Detroit area where my dad was born and raised. Um, I've been in uh, the special agent in charge of the FBI in Michigan since October of 2015. Prior to that, I was our chief inspector of our inspection division at the inspection division at FBI headquarters in Washington, Washington. D.C. Yes. And I have had uh, assignments uh, twice in California, Juneau, Alaska, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, a couple of tours through headquarters, and I was an assistant special agent in charge in New Haven, Connecticut. Sure. As we broadcast in, in all the United States and Canada, and of course we're going to talk about Michigan. And honestly, Michigan is the base for the, the Arab American, Middle Eastern American, for the whole North America. We are the large concentration in Michigan. And the, and the community in Michigan, which is over half a million, they're very effective, they're very involved uh, economically, politically, socially. Tell me how you seen, I know you have background about, about Michigan and Detroit and you were here, but I seen you honestly when you got appointed and a month or, or two months later, you were integrating so heavy with the community. I go to a lot of events and wherever I go, I see you. And I see people from your office talking to the community, trying to build that bridges of understanding the culture, the, the issue of the Middle Eastern. How you see in the Middle Eastern community? The reason I said the Middle Eastern, I wanna combine the Arab, the Chaldean, and, and all of those ethnic minority come from the Middle East. Yeah, Tell I'm, me how you felt the community here. Well, I'm actually gratified to hear that, that you observe us in the community trying to build these relationships. I feel very, very grateful that uh, I've had some excellent predecessors who, who preceded me in this role as FBI special agents in charge, but uh, I would say in the eight months, going on eight months that I've been in Detroit and in Michigan, uh, it's been a crash course for me. I, I come from a ethnically diverse background, but uh, uh, it's been a uh, it's been actually a, a great blessing for me to come to Michigan to come to the Midwest again where I grew up and uh, g to get the experience uh, the diversity of Southeast Michigan and all of Michigan in general and uh, the Arab American population or the Middle Eastern population yes. uh, in this area is is so significant and uh, sometimes uh, sometimes portrayed in different ways around the world and in our own country. And uh, I've learned in my time here that we just have a rich resource in the uh, Middle Eastern community that exists right here. I see. Let's talk about the issue of the Middle Eastern community, the Arab American, the Chaldean community in Michigan. And of course, that Michigan, it could reflect in, in, in California, it could reflect in New York, it could reflect in many different places. But about the Michigan and the concentration, and, and an average American who hear about all those terrorist organizations, about, about uh, a, a very small minority they are, but their voice is a huge. And their propaganda is huge. That's why the media concentrates very heavy on them. But they're very, very small minority. If it's in the, in the Middle East, the Arab world, or somewhere anywhere else. Uh, an average American, he'll see that, well, Michigan have as the hub of the Middle Eastern community. That's mean the terrorist activity is there. That's mean the FBI should watch every street in, in, in Dearborn or in other area. How you handle that thought yeah, of I, I, I've spent a great deal of time in my time in Michigan trying to communicate to the public that we don't face any greater threat in Michigan or Southeast Michigan of extremism yes. uh, 
because of the high concentration of Arab Americans or Middle Easterners uh, in, in this area. In fact, I've found just the opposite. Uh, I've found a very, very uh, patriotic, multi-generational uh, group of people who've been here for a very, very long time. Yes. And uh, their first devotion and, and loyalty is to the United States. So I, I tell people constantly that they are wrong if they think we face greater threats here. Uh, one thing with the, the diversity of the population we do have here is I think there's greater connectivity to areas of the world uh, where there are, you know, there are conflicts and there is extremism. And, and that, can, that can be a, a benefit to us as well because there's people who have accessed the information that's uh, of benefit to us investigatively or to the other foreign law enforcement agencies or the intelligence community because I think we're all dedicated to trying to combat extremism or terrorism no matter what form it exists or where it exists. Absolutely, because they are not against uh, individual, they are against uh, humanity. They, they, they end real and, and, and they criminal and all in their mind to kill more and more people and they don't care if that person is, is a Muslim or a Christian or American or otherwise. So this is, but as I mentioned, you build that uh, bridges with the community. You are coming to the community to understand their culture, their, their issue and all that. Is the community in return open their door to you? The organization, are they working for you? Are you getting call uh, from Arab American, for example, there is a terrorist activity or we think there is something around the near our neighborhood? So is that relation two-way or only one way? It's absolutely two ways. I, I have uh, felt uh, incredible uh, spirit of welcoming me to this area and, uh, and I've been in people's homes. Uh, I've talked to people. There's, there's occasionally, you know, information in the press as we see and people try and uh, sensationalize you know things and they yes. say the FBI the only reason we do the community outreach is to develop sources etc and I, I really resent that it offends me yes. uh, because we're trying to build understanding of our mission we're trying to build partnerships I told one group I said my goodness, I've, I've introduced and brought my, my uh, son and wife to some of these meetings. Yes. If, if I was- I've seen that. Yeah, you have <laughs> seen that. And uh, so uh, we want to be part of the community, the yes. FBI as a whole, myself as the special agent in charge of the FBI in, in Michigan. So uh, I want it to be two-way and I would consider myself a failure if it wasn't two-way. Great. In your department as a whole, do you have, for example, educational, program about a culture, it's not just Arab American, if it's, you know, Michigan is multinational ethnic minority, multi-part of many, many ethnic minority. Do you have that? And in your staff, do you reflect the, the community you're serving? Is there, is there uh, Middle Eastern American? Is there Eastern European? Is there in Indian in, in your, to reflect the, the community you serve? Well. There is diversity in the FBI, but not nearly enough. Uh, it's become a, a priority, uh, a shift priority for the FBI of Director Comey. And then at the state level here in Michigan, I've really made it a priority for the FBI in Detroit to uh, emphasize the recruitment of more diverse uh, people who can join us either in the professional staff ranks or the agent ranks. I think it's important for us to to build the relationships, to have trust, to gain entree. You have to get your foot in the door to have a conversation Absolutely. before you can build a relationship. And, and, and having a, a workforce that's representative of the diversity of our area, of our population, is yeah. essential to be effective at that. Mm -hmm. So we in the FBI in Detroit are really putting an emphasis on that. You asked, do we have programs? W yes. We work at schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at Frederick Douglas uh, uh, Academy in Oak Park the other day, which was a significantly ethnic uh, a student population. I was at the International Children's Festival uh, a week ago on a Sunday where there were representatives for, from 40 different 
uh, countries there and, and performance groups, et cetera. And so our, our efforts are at, are at the school age level, right, right on up to adults, because you see us in the community with yes. the adults all the time. Absolutely. But the age in themselves, that they have, for example, I don't want to say classes, but they have information about the culture of the community they are served. We, there's a variety of ways to do that. We, we try and uh, uh, promote training outside our work responsibilities. Yes. Let me give you an example. I, I was a supervisor a few years ago in Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield has a fairly significant uh, Middle Eastern population. And yes. when I met, I was, uh, was told about uh, by one of the members of the Shura Council there, he mm -hmm. told me that law enforcement didn't generally understand the culture. That's so right. as a <laughs> consequence, there, were, there, were, uh, there was more friction and, and confrontation than was Misunderstanding. necessary. Misunderstanding. Yep. So I, he and I spoke, and uh, we came up with the idea for him to host a one-day course for law enforcement. And I recruited people from my own office, as well as uh, local and state law enforcement. And we had a one-day session where he provided us training. The FBI right. has training opportunities like that uh, throughout our organization. We can do it both through virtual online courses, we bring in experts, we try and uh, tap into speakers who can open our eyes to uh, uh, cultural differences so that we can operate more effectively. Great. You know, there is a lot of member Ramadan is coming and they feel that donating to organization, of course this organization, they're gonna come with issue uh, related to, to poor, to children, but probably uh, the real issue, the real thinking is different than that. And as a member of the community, they might in Ramadan say, let me send 500, let me send 1,000 to this organization. You know, it's, it's something passion inside them. And then he found out this organization is a terrorist group. Tell me what's your advice to the community. Yeah, I, I th first of all, I think uh, as a Christian myself, uh, you know, being charitable is, is part of my, my belief system, a, as it is for Muslims and people of yes. all faiths, right? Yeah. So it's very, very important. I think people should be cautious. Mm -hmm. they, should, uh, they should try and uh, research organizations about which they're unfamiliar uh, okay. to make sure that uh, it's, a, it's a legitimate charitable organization that's not funneling funds to extremist groups or that sort of thing. Uh, the FBI certainly, I'll never apologize for the fact that we investigate the, uh, the uh, uh, dedication of funds to, you know, uh, organizations that have been designated as terrorist organizations or criminal enterprises or that sort and of you thing. Yeah. And, and, and I think we should, but I, I don't think uh, people should be afraid of being charitable. I just think they should be use caution and donate to credible charitable organizations that they have uh, confidence about their goals and objectives. Yes. As you know, many of the Middle Eastern community, they are in business. They are a small and large company and cyber attack and, and, their, and their website or their business activities is becoming increase and increase. Tell me how your office is handling this. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because talk often is about extremism or you know whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. I, I speak frequently, I say the reality is people in Southeast Michigan and Michigan are gonna be faced with a variety of other threats much more likely to impact their lives yes. uh, than, than a terrorist attack. For instance, cyber threats today. There is one type of uh, cyber threat today that's rising in its incidence and that's called ransomware. And uh, ransomware is, is trying to put it simply, because I'm not a computer expert, it, uh, so I won't try and uh, project technical expertise mm -hmm. that I don't have. But ransomware is where uh, criminals, uh, who are very, very proficient in hacking into systems, uh, are able to insert malware or code into companies' computer systems okay. where they now can actually encrypt everything in their system. Wow. Encrypt it means make it paralyze it paralyze it yeah. unreadable oh. and then they send a ransom demand okay. uh, to the victim company and they say in exchange for payment we will pro provide you decryption keys uh, and uh, 
while we don't recommend, much like you know, traditionally the FBI is known for having worked kidnapping, right? Yes. We never yeah. recommend the paying of ransoms. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we don't recommend the paying of ransoms in ransomware. But nonetheless, uh, we don't have a solution, a quick solution, to uh, fixing. Well, that's what I'm going to ask you. Can you help them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, those people they need their their information back. They yeah. need their system back. They do, and and we do have a we have a cyber squad in my office, and there are certain things, limited things that can be done to help. And so often in something like that, we can uh, after the fact try to investigate who's responsible responsible for the crime. Yes. Uh, but the way we can help is to talk to people and try and help them understand the importance of building effective the backup systems. Yes. Really, it's preventative, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'd we'd rather not investigate any crime. We would rather spending time to help people prevent crime. Absolutely. And this is one of those things where uh, people have been uh, lax in their their defensive systems and their computer systems, their networks, and as a result of not having effective backup systems, they're vulnerable to these hackers. So we would encourage folks uh, to tap into whatever expertise is out there in the, the country today okay. to build effective backup systems. Okay, two things, and, and uh, human trafficking, because we are in Canada, I want you to talk about, and targeting our children uh, through the internet, and, and some website and, and I try to, you know, mislead them and all that. Tell me what's your message to the parents, how they should work with their children not to have a problem, create a problem to them. Yeah, that's an that's issue that I feel very, very passionately about, the ex sexual exploitation of our children. Absolutely. Either through, you know, traditional ways of actually uh, trafficking kids mm -hmm. on, on the street today uh, uh, to people who consume uh, that sort of thing to the internet-based uh, mm -hmm. production uh, sharing uh, of uh, uh, child pornography and that sort of thing. Yes. I really find and repulsive. we hear about it almost every day. It's it's it, it's actually one of the bigger problems. It's it's endemic, I think uh, we can find it everywhere. I could dedicate twice as many people in my office to the investigation mm -hmm. of that sort of thing because it's so common today. So what I would urge parents to do is certainly, uh, again, uh, be very, very cautious and be alert and involved in what their children are doing on computer systems. Um, you know, don't give them unfettered access to computer systems because I, I think back to when I was a, a young child. If I'd have had, without without supervision, mm -hmm. unfettered access to the internet, my mm -hmm. you know a, a child's curiosity yeah, I, sure. is is unbridled. So that they will go all kinds of places mm -hmm. and become unwitting victims. And there's all kinds of scams out there. In addition to just exploiting children and people. In the last couple of days, we've rescued. Yesterday, I believe we rescued two 14-year-old girls who were being trafficked yes. in the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there's other things happening now. There are people posing uh, as minors on the internet. So they mm -hmm. strike up a conversation with a 12-year-old or a 13-year-old, yes. yes. and the conversation becomes sexual. And then the conversation becomes, send me a, a, a photo of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then what some of these uh, uh, actors are doing, these criminals are doing, of course they're adults. They're, they're oh, posing I mean, They know what minors. they're doing, yeah. yeah. And then when a child finds out, and they often do find out, and they mm -hmm. say, we're done, the person says, uh, it's called sextortion. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they try and extort a, a child, yeah. and they say, if you don't send me what I need and keep a ready supply of this to me, then I am going to send the photos you've already sent me to your church, to oh. your schoolmates. No. And we've actually investigated and prosecuted several cases where an individual, I think of one recently, that actually sent uh, pornographic images of a minor to that minor's church. Now that's as repulsive as it gets. I see. Uh, David, we've seen a news coming from Let's be honest, so from Detroit, everybody's killing. Every day there is people killing. There is children playing with guns. It seemed like, to, when, when you listen to those no, news, it seemed like we, we lose the, the, the grip on those criminals. And it seemed like, you know, it's, they have to do whatever they want. And instead of fighting in, in verbally, they're using guns these days. Yeah. 
So tell me how the FBI working together with different police department, state dep uh, the p state police and, and, and different city uh, police department to, to handle this. Because if it's in Detroit, tomorrow is going to go to the suburbs. Right. And well, you, you speak to one of the greatest problems I think we face today, and that's a rise in violent crime. Yes. I've been happy to report uh, until recently that Detroit was one of the few major metropolitan areas in the United States that actually saw a reduction in the number of homicides last year. Yes. But as we saw two or three or four weeks ago, there were 21 shootings. Yes. Uh, Eight and, people. And one weekend, nine and one shooting. weekend. Yeah. On, yeah, one weekend, one yeah. weekend, yes. 21 shootings, seven yeah. people murdered. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is one of our biggest concerns. What the FBI in Michigan does is we partner with the Michigan State Police, local police agencies, the Tr Detroit Police Department, Wayne County Sheriff's, Oakland County Sheriff's. Uh, you name the agency yeah. locally, and we've formed task forces. Great. And we deputize officers from other uh, uh, agencies, both local and state. Mm -hmm. We deputize them federally, which permits them to use the tools we have as federal investigators and we also bring cases federally. One of the advantages of bringing a case to U.S. court rather than a state court sometimes is uh, if someone is sentenced, it, when someone is sentenced in the federal system, they will do a minimum of about 85 percent of that time. There's yes. no there, there's no early release or good behavior, mm -hmm. etc. They're going to do most of that time. So there's a great appeal to our local and state partners to partnering with us to bring some of these cases in federal court. And as you know, you've met Barb McQuaid, the U.S. Oh, yeah. Attorney. And, Great uh, person. Yep. And out in the Western District, we have similar partnerships, and uh, they're very, very aggressive in trying to help. And in fact, in this area, we have something called the Violence Reduction Network, and it's a nationwide effort to try and target some of the most violent cities in the United States, Flint and Detroit being two of them. Yes. And we've put extra effort into those localities. I see. Well, you told me about the, 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 the working with all the, the enforcement agency to 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 solve major a problem here, but internationally, is the FBI have, for example, offices in our embassies throughout the world, so they could communicate, so they could uh, prevent the problem before it happened, as you mentioned. Do you have that, and how would work? Absolutely, uh, the FBI has approximately. I'm probably wrong on the exact number, but approximately uh, 60 or more. Uh, offices around the world in our U.S. In 60 embassies. countries? In 60 wow. countries. We have what are called legal attaches, and these are representatives of the FBI who work with the host nation's law enforcement mm -hmm. agencies yes. to help them with crime problems they have or things they may need investigatively from the United States, yes. such as fugitives. Sometimes mm -hmm. a fugitive from another country of the world has come here and they That's need right. help locating that fugitive. Similarly, our legats work with uh, the host nation law enforcement agencies uh, with some of our fugitives and some of our crime problems and some of these transnational organized crime groups. We work collectively to try and combat criminal enterprises that uh, aren't confined within the boundaries of one nation. I see. The people who immigrate to the United States, and a lot of them they have, uh, I think they call it match name, and it takes a long time for the FBI to investigate. I mean, there is a lot of name you could have 50, 100 people with the same name, yep. same first name, and, 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 and a lot of time they use the, the, the father's name as their last name. And, and this is common in the Arab world, Muhammad Ali, or whatever it is, or Yusuf, you know. So are you working together with those embassy to easy that problem, to solve that much needed problem? Yeah, we do everything we can. That's a that's across all federal law enforcement agencies. Yes. It's our international partners, and you know we have to be vigilant uh, uh, about uh, people we believe represents uh, threats Absolutely. to the United States mm -hmm. and to our, our our foreign partners around the world. Uh, that being said, there are these instances where there's name similarities and that sort of thing, and, and we do our best to work with partners to try and get those resolved because. None of us would want that uh, happening to ourselves. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's important, yeah. but we, we, can't, uh, we can't sacrifice vigilance right now 
Uh, we're always trying to do it more effectively, mm -hmm. uh, but the mission at the end of the day is to protect the United States. Great. Well, finally, this is my first interview with you, and hopefully we're going to get uh, more and more in the future. So we talk about the issue facing the, the, the FBI and the issue that between the FBI and the ethnic minority, majority of the people they watch us are of Middle Eastern community. So we're going to tackle all the issue related to the Middle Eastern community. But give me two minutes or three minutes, your message to the Middle Eastern community how you want them to deal with you, how you want them to, to work together with you, whatever you have in mind, give me that two minutes. Yeah, I, I truly believe in the, the value or the concept of a global community. So when I work with the, the community in this area, uh, I want them to understand, I want people to understand that I, I respect uh, the differences that exist. If you were to walk into my office today, you would notice on my hutch above my desk, I have three flags. I have the Greek flag, the Ukrainian flag, oh, okay. and the U.S. flag. Mm -hmm. So I believe absolutely in the value of diversity, and and I want the uh, I want the diverse community because I, I know your your constituency is the Middle Eastern community. Yes. Uh, <laughs> The yeah. Detroit area certainly is mm -hmm. much, much more diverse uh, yeah. than the Middle Eastern community. Sure. And, and that's the importance of going to things like the International Children's Festival. Mm -hmm. We had a uh, diversity training a seminar for all my employees about a month ago, and we did a little exercise. And I think it speaks to the value of diversity. Yes. We did an exercise where uh, the, the, uh, the proctors of the class asked us to make a list of all the animals we thought began with the letter G that we could identify. Mm -hmm, yeah. And uh, I, I'll, I'll readily admit I could only come up with four or five and I, I had one in Spanish, gato. <laughs> so, uh, and others might have gotten nine yeah. or 10, but mm -hmm. when we collectively put our, all our answers yes. together, I think we were in 50, 60, or 70 animals with uh, beginning with the letter G. It's a very simplistic uh, example, but I think it speaks to the power of diversity and when you have a question or you have a problem, uh, by bringing diverse groups working together. working together to solve a problem, to come up with an answer, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to be successful. So as a consequence of this rich mosaic that is Southeast Michigan and Michigan today, I think the potential for us to be successful in all that we do, so long as we have these great partnerships, is unlimited. Well, David, honestly, I thank you. As I mentioned, I go to a lot of events and I see David right there <laughs> talking to people, uh, talking about their issue, understand their culture. And, and that makes the community very comfortable. And, and we appreciate that from you so much. And, and you're integrating with the organization, coming here and talking to the community. Uh, we appreciate that very much. And we thank you for your passion. We thank you for understanding the issue and the culture of the Middle Eastern community. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to get to spend some time with you and share my thoughts. And I hope it's not the last time. I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Dear viewer, that was my interview with uh, David Chilios. He is the special agent in charge of the FBI. As you see, Today, the FBI working together with the community they represent, with the ethnic minority, with everybody to prevent one thing, that no, no threat come to us. Those criminals, when, 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 they, when they threaten us, they don't understand Muslim and Christian, Polish, uh, Armenian, Arab, Chaldean. They are against all of us. And we should work very close with the people from the federal agency to inform them about anything. If you see something, say something. And this is a prevent you, prevent your neighborhood. Probably it's going to prevent uh, the, your family from getting hurt. So when you see them, open your heart to them, talk to them, and again, uh, please thank them for the service they do because they are working very hard to protect us. Thank you for, very much, and thank you for watching. Thank you for sharing, and thank you, David, for coming here again. Thank you.